There we go. And also I have enabled the closed captioning. And if that's annoying to anyone, there is a way to hide it. If you click on the dot, dot, dot more sort of button at the bottom of your screen, there's a hide transcript option. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll have a, a good conversation today. Um, so this is the inaugural discussion of our sort of ongoing, what we hope to be an ongoing discussion series called Let's Talk About Digital Threats to Democracy. Um, and this is something that the League of Women Voters of Maine has been wanting to start putting on to educate our members and anyone else who's interested in sort of the intersection of our sort of contemporary digital world um, with sort of corporatization and social media giants and all of that um, and our democracy and how those forces, um, online forces might impact our democratic process. Um, and so for tonight, we're gonna be talking about um, privacy, specifically about data privacy and the criminalization of abortion. Um, so we have, two great guests. Um, so we have um, Cade Crockford, who's the director of the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. Cade works on issues at the intersection of technology and civil rights and civil liberties, focusing on how systems of surveillance and control impact not just society in general, but their primary targets, people of color, Muslims, immigrants, and dissidents. Recently, Cade led the ACLU of Massachusetts Press Pause on Face Surveillance Program campaign, which has thus far won the passage of a state law regulating police use of facial recognition and eight municipal bans on government use of facial face surveillance technology, including in Massachusetts's four largest cities. And Haley Sukuyama is senior legislative activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, focusing on state legislation. Prior to joining EFF, she spent nearly eight years as a consumer technology reporter at the Washington Post, writing stories on the industry's largest companies. Haley, who is CIPP US certified by the International Association of Privacy Professionals, has an MA in journalism from the University of Missouri and a BA in history from Vassar College. So the way we're going to structure this today is we're going to have um, Kate and Haley um, spend some time sort of talking with us about um, this, this topic and sort of outlining some of the issues, especially we, we sent um, some, we had some articles in the event description that we recommended people read and I'll post those in the chat, but in case you didn't read those or in case you had sort of wanted more information, they'll have a little bit of time each to talk about um, the issue. And then I'll, I have a couple questions to sort of start the ball, ball rolling. And then we can kind of go into some of your questions for them and kind of hope to get a discussion going. Um, so Cade, would you like to talk for a bit about this issue? Sure. Um, first off, let me just say thank you for the invitation. It's really great to be here. It's great to be here with Haley, who's a um, coalition partner that we at the ACLU of Massachusetts have worked with a lot on um, a variety of issues here in Massachusetts. Um, also, just want to say, because she would be mad if I didn't, that my wife, Omi Amar Singham, used to work at the ACLU of Maine and I think probably knows many of you and sends her love and says she really misses Maine. Um, <laughs> so hi from Omi. Um, we also, uh, you know, in the introduction, you talked a little bit about the face surveillance campaign. Um, I worked very closely with uh, Mickey Cabede and Megan Sway at the ACLU of Maine uh, to pass uh, what I actually think is the strongest law in the country on uh, police use of facial recognition up at the Maine legislature um, a year ago. So congratulations to Maine. You have a really, really great facial recognition law. Uh, thanks to the ACLU. Um, so this is a really scary time. You know, it's a scary time to, to, be, to be in this country. It's a scary time to be a woman or a person who can have a baby in this country. Um, I think all of us are watching to see what happens in November with bated breath, you know, things could get substantially worse, obviously. Um, we, we know that people in half the states in the US are, you know, potentially at risk of criminal prosecution just for seeking um, basic healthcare services, um, which is terrifying, frankly. 
we also know that that things could get worse if uh, the Republican Party takes control of Congress and the presidency and passes a national abortion ban. Um, so, you know, in the context of the of the Dobbs ruling and all of these terrible state laws that we're seeing popping up around the country, denying people their reproductive rights, I think it's really valuable to take a step back and reflect on privacy as a value. Um, for a long time, I've been doing privacy and technology work for over a decade. And for a long time, people have asked me, well, why should I care about what you know the government or Google or whomever is doing with my personal information? I have nothing to hide, right? Or why should I care if the police are collecting information about me? I've, I haven't done anything wrong. And I think that really mis, misunderstands both why privacy is valuable and frankly, um, is a question that people are not asking anymore. Those are statements that people are no longer making um, in 2022 in the post Dobbs era, because now it's very clear to people, particularly to 50% of the population, the relationship between control over our personal information, information about the healthcare services that we seek, our communications, the websites that we visit, Etc., and our ability to control our own lives. That is a crystal clear connection now, I think, in the minds of many people because of the Dobbs ruling. And of course, the Roe decision itself was about privacy. Um, now the, the Dobbs decision uh, has you know, eradicated the national protection that we had in place, even though it was being weakened for many years. So the landscape has changed quite a bit. What does that leave us with? Well, you know, people, I've thought a lot about this. We obviously knew that this was coming. It was not a shock when the Supreme Court um, issued this ruling. And so those of us who do this work have been thinking for quite some time, well, how do we actually protect people in those uh, 25 or 26 states? How do we, you know, what kind of laws can we pass to ensure that in the safe states like Maine, like Massachusetts and California and New York and Illinois, where abortion is protected as a right, how can we protect people who are coming from states like Texas and Louisiana to seek abortion care? How can we ensure that their personal information is protected that to the degree possible, you know, we're ensuring that people are able to come allowing corporations or even our police departments at the state or local level to um, facilitate their criminal prosecution in their home state. And so there are a couple of things that I've been thinking about related to this. There's one thing that I think everybody just needs to know, which is that the way that we've historically thought about data privacy and especially government access to our private information doesn't really work very well for us in this context. And that's because historically, the civil rights libertarian response to new police surveillance technologies, to police wanting to get access to our text message information or our emails or our search histories when they're stored by private companies has been to say, okay, you know, the police should be required to get a warrant, right? That's kind of the gold standard of American justice. We say, you know, the cops shouldn't be able to invade your privacy unless they have probable cause to show that you're involved in a crime and they take that probable cause to a judge and they get a warrant and then they serve that warrant on Google or, you know, Facebook or whatever to obtain the information that they're looking for. Well, that doesn't really work in the world in which abortion is a crime, right? If abortion is a crime in Texas, the police in Texas can very easily get a warrant to access information from someone's email, someone's text messages, you know, to use against them in a criminal prosecution related to homicide, right? I mean, so we are now facing a totally different world. Um, we are facing one in which those traditional protections like the warrant requirement simply do not protect people because things that Many of us, I think probably everybody here, believes ought to be basic human rights like access to healthcare are now criminalized. And so I think that sends, that makes me think of two things and then I'll pass it to Haley. One is that we need to completely rethink the way that we approach digital privacy because 
we know now that we cannot rely on the law being moral and just, right? And so there may be areas where we need to simply say, the government cannot have access to this information, period. Or companies cannot collect this information, period. Or, and this is the second thing I wanted to say, we should start thinking much more seriously about passing laws at the state level that prohibit certain types of uh, commercial exploitation of, of private sensitive information. So in Massachusetts, we're going to be working on legislation in the coming session to ban the sale and trade of cell phone location data in the private marketplace. Now you might be thinking, what does this have to do with abortion care? It has a lot to do with abortion care. Because if I'm in Texas and I'm a prosecutor there and I wanna know who's traveling from Texas to Maine or Texas to Massachusetts to access abortion care, I don't have to get a warrant to access uh, people's cell phone location information. All I have to do is pull out my credit card and sign up for a data broker service and I can access not just one person's cell phone location information, but the cell phone location information of hundreds of millions of people and you know, determine then, based on those patterns that I'm looking at, who I ought to be investigating, uh, who I suspect maybe has traveled from Texas to Massachusetts or to Maine to obtain an abortion. So that's a whole unregulated market that exists out there. People are buying and trading and selling your cell phone location information. And that is incredibly dangerous to people who need to leave a state like Texas to seek abortion services in a state where they are protected. And so that is one of the things that we will be working to do here in Massachusetts is to essentially cut off that market to say that's not acceptable. And obviously doing so will not only benefit people who are seeking abortion care, it will also benefit the rest of us because frankly, it's inappropriate and unacceptable for companies to be buying and trading and selling that type of very sensitive information that shows where we live, where we work, you know, when we're home, when we're not, the patterns of our lives, whether we go to AA meetings, whether we go to gay bars, whether we're having an affair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if, if anybody in, on this call is interested in that legislation, uh, I would love to talk to you about it offline. You know, I think this is something that we really ought to be pursuing in many more states. Um, and thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really helpful sort of overview. i um, gonna throw it over to Haley in case you have other things to add to that from the sort of Electronic Frontier Foundation sort of framework. Yeah, well, um, yeah, first of all, thanks again for having me and Kate, that was a great, um, a great overview. And it's like, what else can I really add, but I'll, I'll come up with a couple of things. Um, so uh, Kate definitely is, is right that we have to kind of rethink the frame about, you know, how, how, what tools we have in the toolkit to protect people in these situations. Um, and so a thing that we have been working on at, um, at EFF is legislation um, with states that are, you know, that provide these rights, that um, that have a commitment to providing these rights and making them sort of data sanctuaries um, for people who are seeking this care. So in California, for example, we had a couple of laws um, that really seek to make sure that um, if you do get a warrant, you know, if you're a company or a healthcare provider that gets a warrant from, from an out of state um, law enforcement agency, um, and they're asking for information that is, you know, um, in violation of a, of a law in their state, but it conflicts with California's Reproductive Privacy Act, that you don't have to comply with that warrant. So um, we're really working on, you know, these, these are really complicated. And I'm not a lawyer, um, as, you, as you heard, my background is, is in journalism, but um, these are complicated questions of how states interact with each other. But I think we're definitely seeing a split emerge um, at the state legislative level of, you know, of states that are really going after these rights and states that are trying to protect them. So California um, passed, as I said, a package of bills trying to um, address, you know, if if a California court gets a you know a warrant, they don't uh, issue a corresponding warrant, right, for for a California company or for a healthcare provider in California. So that is one um, that is one way that we are currently looking at um, the legislative toolkit. New York passed um, similar laws. Um, and so, you know, we're definitely seeing those kinds of ideas emerge. Um, 
that gets at one avenue, right? Um, I think another way, way that we're looking, again, to piggyback off Kate's point is um, we are trying to look at ways to limit the information that these companies have and retain in the first place. So um, yes, I'll be sure to uh, send over a, a list um, to the organizers later. Um, but um, so we're looking at trying to limit the, the information that companies have or that anybody has in the first place. So um, at the federal level, um, EFF has supported a bill called My Body, My Data um, by Representative Sarah Jacobs, who is a California legislature, legislator. Um, and she um, th that bill is, is a data minimization bill. So it says um, data minimization, as you may be able to guess from the term, means that you're only collecting the information that you need um, to provide a service and nothing more. So, um, you know, if you're if you are um, concerned about your location information being sold to a data broker, you know, that kind of stuff, um, you know, that if if you're using a, an app um, to track information that could be used to infer things about your reproductive health, that those companies aren't supposed to collect more um, information than they strictly need to provide the service. Um, so that gets at the issue in a different way, right? It sort of shrinks the amount of available information that um, that companies have to turn over in the first place. They can't turn over what they don't have, and that's sort of um, one idea that we have of, of how to address it, address this issue. Um, you know, we are also trying to brainstorm more about protections, um, not only for those who are seeking reproductive care, which of course is is very important, but also the people who are supporting them, um, because I think the the thing that that kills me the most about this whole situation well i don't know the most but one thing that kills me a lot about the situation is that you know i just try to think of if you are a if you're a high school student and you find yourself needing an abortion um the last thing you're probably going to think about is your data privacy right i mean honestly probably the first thing you're going to do is go to google um <laughs> and so um it it really pains me to think about you know sort of trying to layer on this extra, you know, set of concerns about privacy, which of course is very important. Um, but um, it just, you know, for someone in that situation, it's probably not a thing that's top of mind, even though um, sadly it, it has to be. Um, and so we are trying to think about ways that, um, that companies can take on a lot of that burden, right? With the data minimization, that governments can commit to, state governments can commit to, you know, not putting information that could be incriminating into databases that are shared with other law enforcement agents, uh, agencies out of state. Um, because sometimes you don't need a warrant, you just need to log into your shared database that you that you have with another state. Um, and so uh, really just trying to think about erect, erecting those barriers so that, again, the people who are obviously in a very vulnerable and scary position don't have to necessarily take on all the all the onus themselves, um, which is unfortunately sort of where we are right now. Um, and so, um, you know, we're still brainstorming about things. I think um, there was obviously, as you would imagine, from where I sat, a lot of interest in um, in passing legislation on this uh, late in the session last year. Um, because of the timing, you know, we didn't see um, all the bills and every idea come up. Um, and so I think uh, people are brainstorming right now. Um, I'm really glad to hear, you know, Cade um, is working on a broader location privacy bill. I think we're also going to hear people working on broader health privacy bills because um, the issues implicated in this debate, you know, as Kate said, apply to a range of situations. Um, and so, you know, maybe we can use some of that momentum um, to get protections, not only for, for these populations, but for all populations. Um, and I, the other thing I would add too, is that, you know, we're, we're here, we're talking about abortion rights, but we're also thinking um, about many of the same threats to those who are seeking gender affirming care. And so we are also seeing some of those pill, bills pop up as well, um, which I think is good because I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the concerns are, are the same, so. Thank you, yeah. Um, so this is a lot of information, I think, for us to digest. Um, this is very helpful information, um, but perhaps uh, I want to ask a very basic question that both of you touched on a little bit. Um, if you could just expand upon, in terms of the scope of the problem, some concrete examples about the data that is um, 
being gathered from people in a day-to-day -day way and how that might intersect with pe when people seek or support abortion care. Um, what kinds of like data specifically might get caught up in that? I think just that for myself, um, the ways that data is collected from me on a day-to-day -day basis has kind of become invisible in my life. So wondering if either of you could kind of speak to that. Um, I mean, I can start and then Haley, if you want to jump in with additions, you know, there was a lot of uh, noise making early on after Dobbs about things like period tracker apps, right? Oh, the prosecutors are going to get access to your period tracker. Well, probably not. I mean, maybe, you know, I guess that's possible, but it strikes me as highly unlikely that, you know, they would kind of cast a net in that way. Um, Honestly, I think primarily for the reason that prosecutors, the vast majority of the men at least, have no idea how the human reproductive system functions and wouldn't know what to do with information from a period tracking app. I mean, you know, the fact that so many men have legislated to ban abortions, given that, you know, in the context of like so many people who want babies, desperately want babies needing abortions, you know, tells me kind of all I need to know about their knowledge of the human, about human reproductive anatomy, which is like, they, they basically don't know the fucking first thing. So anyway, I'm not really concerned about the use of period tracking apps. What is very concerning is people's text messages, right? That's really what we've seen is, you know, the people who, and, and I just want to say also, if you read the article that was sent around that I wrote with a colleague of mine, Nate Wesley, you'll see that there's, this is not new in the United States, the idea that women would be criminalized for, you know, their reproductive functions, essentially. Women, especially poor, black, brown, indigenous women have been criminalized in this country for years for having miscarriages. I mean, this is not, you know, that's not new either. Thousands of women have faced criminal prosecution because their uh, their fetuses have died, and you know they've been charged with neglect, you know um, manslaughter, you know people have been charged because they allegedly took drugs or drank while they were pregnant, and then and then the fetus died. So we know because of those prosecutions and because of some recent cases as well that you know the prosecutors are going to use the kind of same stuff that they use when they're prosecuting drug cases and. And you know other other crimes. They're going to use people's text messages. They did this recently. You know, a young woman saying to her friend in a text, you know, like I don't want this baby. Well, that's intent, right? Um, so that's one like really important category. And the and the positive thing about text messages is that unlike many of these other many other kinds of data that we produce that prosecutors may may be using against people. There's actually something we can do about that short of law reform, which is people need to use encrypt, encrypted messaging applications. And there's one that's very easy. It's called Signal, like smoke signal, Signal. And if you download Signal, it works just like any other messaging app. It's extremely easy to use. The only thing you need to do is make sure that the other person you're communicating with also has Signal installed. And the simplest thing you can do is just turn on this thing that says disappearing messages. You can set it to an hour, a day, a week, a month, whatever. And then your messages will automatically delete themselves. So this is a really important tool that we can all use to make sure that, you know, if someone, a, a young woman in your life, whoever reaches out, I have a question about abortion, you know, how can I access abortion pills, et cetera, that conversation will disappear from your phone without you even having to do anything about it. If you turn on disappearing messages and nobody, no prosecutor, no one will be able to access that information. So text messages are a big one. I think the other big one, and Haley, after this, if you have thoughts, please share them, is people's search histories. You know, a lot of people are going to be in trouble because they're, you know, the prosecutors are going to ask Google, well, you know, tell us who searched for Misa Prostal, right? Tell us who searched for uh, how to how to do an abortion at home, right? Tell us, you know, who searched for um, how to, you know, how to travel to Massachusetts to get an abortion, whatever. Um, even potentially Google, Googling Planned Parenthood in Texas could, could you know, cause trouble for people uh, down the line. So I think those, those to me are the two really big areas. 
There are others. Location data is a big one, as I said before. But I think you know the 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 low hanging fruit, really, the places where prosecutors are going to go first: people's private communications, like their text messages, and also Facebook messages. You know, um, the 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 like private ones that are not really private, but the ones that seem private on Facebook, and then and then things like search history. Thank you. That is that is helpful. Um, the case that actually caught our interest in thinking about this as a topic for this discussion series was a case of a Nebraska woman um, and police used Facebook messages between her and her daughter um, to investigate her for um, charges around illegal abortion. Um, Haley, did you have any other examples to add in terms of what types of data would be used? Well, I mean, I think Kate is absolutely right. You know, I'm, it's it's sort of a thing where we're trying to think in the short to medium term and then sort of like once there's more prosecution, like what might they use to build case, right? So maybe not to necessarily identify people, but to build cases. And so I think that is where some things like location information comes in, right? Where your license plate was scanned, you know, going down the highway where, um, where your lift a ride was went from the airport, those kinds of things. Um, if you may have been in an area around a clinic, right? There are these kinds of warrants that are very broad that are based on, on location. Um, and so I think those are more, more down the line. I mean, certainly what Kate is right that, you know, in terms of prosecutions we're seeing in places where, in states where there were already these more restrictive laws, right? It is the things like the keyword searches like the like the communications that we're that we're seeing, but um, I think down the line, I am I am worried about you know sort of as they're building cases against people, could they see like what your Fitbit um, you know app was saying about your gait? Could they see what it was saying about your temperature? Could they be seeing what you know sort of all these other things? So um, yeah, that's that's really what I would add. Yeah, thank you, um, and. Katie, you already sort of started answering this question. Um, and I do want to sort of keep a conversation at the like systemic, you know, level of uh, sort of what we can do for legislative advocacy. But I also do want to ask, like, beyond using signal, like, are there other specific things that you all, both of you would recommend um, for individuals in navigating how to keep their data private, um, especially if they're um, seeking reproductive health care? Yeah, I think um, signals the 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 most important. Then there are a couple others as well. One is um, using a, a search engine that's not Google. So you can use DuckDuckGo, um, which you know provides the same access to information that you need online, but um, is likely not going to be the target of a of a police subpoena or a warrant. Um, because frankly, I think police don't really even know DuckDuckGo exists. And to the extent that they do, DuckDuckGo does not keep records of um, its of how you how how you use the website. So they would have nothing to give the police. Um, and then the other thing that people can do is use a either a virtual private network or the Tor browser, which is um, a web browser that anonymizes all your internet traffic. So essentially like, you know, the internet is a series of tubes and what happens when you visit from your house, you know, google.com or uh, plannedparenthood.com is that you're not only communicating that information to Google or Planned Parenthood, you're also communicating it to your ISP or internet service provider. Uh, you guys in Maine happen to have, I think, the best law in the country, in part because of my wife, actually, Omi's work at the ACLU of Maine on ISP privacy, internet service provider privacy, which is to say your ISPs can't, you know, sell your data to other companies, but they can retain it and, and law enforcement can access those records from your internet service provider. They would know, for example, that you visited Planned Parenthood, et cetera online. But if you use a VPN, um, you can protect your internet communicate, you know, your internet activities, even from your ISP. So um, it basically like encrypts the the information that you're, you know, sending to various websites across across the internet. So I would use a VPN or the Tor browser, which is free. I would use Signal, 
And I, you know, I would use DuckDuckGo as a search engine. Those are, I think, the, the simplest, you know, most effective means of protecting your online privacy. Anything to add, Haley? Yeah, so I was just going to drop in. We do have a little bit of a guide um, for, we have a guide actually for people seeking abortion. Um, you will see Signal and Tor mentioned in that guide as well. Um, we also have a guide um, on it's actually linked off of that um, off of that page providers for uh, digital safety tips for providers of abortion support. I think just to um, augment what Kate said, the other thing I would really recommend is thinking about um, compartmentalizing sort of uh, any activity you know that you think might get, might get you in trouble from your normal email addresses. Um, so you know, make a new address. Don't use um, don't use your work account, don't use your personal account, um, really try and uh, separate um, those discussions as much, much as possible. Um, and then, you know, remember that privacy, we always say privacy is a team sport. So um, make sure that your uh, community that you're working with is aware of, you know, what tools that they should be using as well. Um, you know, if you're, if you're just doing this individually, um, it, you know, it, it has less impact than if you can get a, a community to, to agree together. Um, you know, again, I wish there was an easier um, answer and that companies and governments were more aware of, you know, not putting all this onus on on individuals, but um, we're working on we're working on that. And this is what we have in the meantime. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if my colleague, John, if you have any questions and then maybe we can kind of transition into if any of you um, who are listening in have questions as well, um, you can sort of start throwing those into the chat so we can get to them. Yeah, this has been really informative and fascinating. And I guess I had a general question about whether there's a role for um, social media and other platforms in protecting us. And um, is there a way to, you know, sort of a pathway to kind of pressure them um, to adopt stronger protections like California or wherever um, against cooperation or retaining data in a way that is accessible and available uh, to law enforcement in these circumstances. Why don't you start this one, Haley, and I'll fill in any. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think there are, we kind of have a, <laughs> I just, I'll just keep linking to EFF blog posts, how about that? Um, we have another uh, suggestion for, um, specifically for digital platforms, which a lot of it is, um, touches on, sorry, let me find my, there you go. Um, a lot of it touches on, on some of the things that we've said, right, about um, not collecting data that you don't need in the first place. So, you know, stop this kind of um, behavioral tracking to the extent that you can, um, that sort of thing. Don't retain it, certainly for any longer than you need. Uh, delete it regularly because again um, when it comes to what part of what we're worried about with companies it's just um, you know making sure that they can't get what you don't have right um, so really keeping that frame in mind um, and then you know things like uh, obviously employing encryption where where we can um, you know not um, having the platforms themselves limit sort of what they share and sell um, to third parties um, and then just in terms of, you know, transparency practices, like, you know, letting people know when their information may be subject, you know, if you can let people know when, when their information is subject to a warrant or, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. So really being centering people um, as much as, as they can and really kind of limiting the, the liability that they carry when they carry that kind of data. Yeah, I think, you know, I just scrolled through the blog post. The only thing that I would add that I didn't see mentioned there is that uh, tech companies can stop lobbying against good privacy laws. That would be really great if uh, the Facebooks of the world would stop meddling in our affairs uh, as a democracy and stop using their industry representatives. They have these associations. TechNet is one of them that go around lobbying state state capitals and and telling lawmakers not to pass good privacy legislation so to me that would be one of the best things they could do is just to get out of the way and let us um pass some some good laws that you know are going to impact their bottom line 
you know, certainly Facebook will suffer financially if we can pass really good privacy laws, but you know, too bad, get a different job in my opinion, um, you know, <laughs> find a different business model that doesn't rely on, you know, exploiting people's private information for profit. So. Yeah, <laughs> definitely agree with that. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet, but if anybody does have questions or sort of comments to add to this discussion, um, please feel free to add those into the chat. We do have a little bit of time here. Um, um, yeah, John, uh, do you want to ask another? Well, I, yeah, I just had another. So this is such a novel area for us, and we're still kind of grappling with the basics. But just wondered if you get, if you two could sort of assess like as a practical matter, how this is going to come up, like walk us through an illustration of a situation. Do you, do you think that states are going to like find the, find the person that they wanna go after and then try to get the data to build the case against them? Or do you think that they're gonna look at the data and find out you know, what's going on and then try to identify the person that's associated with that data? Well, I think it remains to be seen. You know, we've mostly seen, and I think, you know, the, the, the history that we have here that's instructive is the stuff about, you know, them going after poor women for miscarrying and things like that. And, and what we've seen from that history is that usually they have a suspect, right, in mind. And then, you know, they go to see if they can find evidence for the, the argument that they want to make about this person's criminal liability by you know, subpoenaing or getting a warrant to access their Facebook messages or whatever. But what we're worried about is, is now the approach that you know, the, the, the national security state and the police have taken to the war on drugs, which is much more of a dragnet kind of um, approach, applying that to, uh, to this context, to people seeking reproductive, and as Haley said, also gender affirming care in states where where that healthcare is protected. And so that's where something like the location data comes in because, you know, if I'm an investigator in Texas and I'm really gun ho on making my, you know, political reputation off of um, prosecuting people for crossing state lines to get abortions, or I'm just some, you know, absolute weirdo who wants to spend my life, you know, persecuting people for their healthcare needs and want to pursue civil litigation against someone for doing that, I could, I could cast a very wide net and access this uh, location data that's held by these data brokers to try to figure out who I should target based on, you know, that kind of uh, information that's available commercially. So, you know, the, the answer is historically, I think it's mostly been the former, but it could also spill into the latter. And, and we're definitely worried about that. I will also say, though, a big caveat for all of this is that you know i think the republicans may have bitten off more than they can than they can chew with this job stuff you know we're about to see in november whether that's the case but you know is it a political winner for for republicans for prosecutors to actually incarcerate uh women for uh having abortions that remains to be seen you know so there's a lot of, there are some unknowns here as well that are more like political like you know do we think that they're actually going to do this it hasn't happened on a mass scale yet, um, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't. And crucially, the threat of prosecution, the threat of being sued is per maybe going to deter people from seeking the healthcare that they need, whether or not uh, prosecutors or you know civil litigants actually start going after people. And I think that that's actually what the anti uh, reproductive rights movement is is betting on that they don't have to you know prosecute people or lock people up because just the threat of that is going to lead to the outcomes that they want which is forced pregnancy yeah um, that's a really good answer and those are some sort of scary scenarios um, Haley do you have anything to add and then we have a raised hand. So no, I'll that was just a, that was just a chef's kiss of an answer. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Jillian, if you want to come off mute to ask your question, and then we have a volley in the chat. So let's see how many we can get to. Sure. Um, thanks for doing this. I actually think the threat to doctors is as big a problem so far as threats to women. Um, there was an article this morning in the Washington Post that de detailed all of the underground. Um, ab abortion pill, you know, uh, 
network that's building. And um, I was excited and also really worried for these organizations who are now out th there. Um, and I've gotten several calls from people in my uh, you know, circle saying, I really want to support these people. Does that put me at risk? And um, and so I'm, you know, what are the risks if we decide, if somebody decides to donate to one of these networks um, that is forming? Um, you know, I'm 64. I have my child. I'm not going to do this. I want to make sure that she has protection. And so that's what, but I'm getting calls. I've gotten seven calls this morning um, since that article came out saying, I want to help. I want to support this. Am I going to get tracked? My, I, my, what I told them is I would guess anything we do gets tracked at this point. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Haley, if you want to jump in, by all means, my, my view on this is like, the more people sort of stand up and will and say, I don't care about your immoral laws, you know, we're going to provide the health care that people need the less likely it is that any individual who's involved in, you know, illegal resistance, you know, resistance that's illegal in a place like Texas is going to be harmed as a result, right? Or prosecuted or anything like that. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen, you know? And I think that people are gonna have to make a choice for themselves about the level of risk that they're willing to uh, undertake, you know, or put themselves at, at. Um, and I, you know, I can't, I can't really advise whether or not people ought to be making those risks or shouldn't. Um, I think a lot of people are going to take those risks and, you know, they're going to take them because the alternative is, you know, young women being forced to have children that they don't want or can't have. Um, you know, that's certainly what we saw in the pro in the pre-row context um, with networks like the one in Chicago, you know, some people are just going to say, I'm willing to, to risk it. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that there's much that, um, that can, can really be done about, about that short of changing the laws in places like Texas. So, you know, if people are willing to take the risk, I say, you know, go for it. If you're not, don't. Um, and the, the, the like digital privacy suggestions that Haley linked to in that EFF article are really good ones to share around with people. I'll just say again, that I think that the connection between this and the war on drugs is really illustrative. You know, like, what are we talking about here? We're talking about pills, <laughs> you know? We're talking about people moving pills from Mexico maybe into the United States. Um, we're talking about people moving pills from places like Massachusetts to places like Texas where, you know, you can't get access to them. We're talking about people uh, accessing pills that are prescribed for things like ulcers, you know, for another purpose. Um, and so again, I think, you know, everything that we've learned about the war on drugs is, is unfortunately going to come home to roost in some really dramatic ways. Um, Cause that's what this is really about. It's about pills. I, I agree with all of that. I mean, I will say, you know, there certainly are states, Texas and Missouri being top of mind that, you know, are trying specifically to go after people who are supporting people in, in their efforts to get abortions um, for residents of those states. Um, and so that is that is deeply concerning to me. I think we have to see how that plays out. Right. Again, as Kate was talking about, like how eager is a is a, a a regulator to go after those people, how eager is a prosecutor to go after those people. Um, so, I mean, I think it's worth going in with your eyes open to the risks of what of what engaging in that activity may um, may do, how, how it may affect you. But I also agree with Kate 100% that like, now you know those risks and then you just have to make a personal decision about how much risk you're willing to take on. And now we have some tips. Um from you all about how to mitigate your risk if you choose to take it on. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna skip over the question about the EU for now, just cause I think that is, uh, could be a long answer if we can get to it. But um, I'm gonna start with these questions. Um, we have sort of two questions in the chat about sort of state level action. Um, so someone from Oregon is um, 
trying to work on these issues at the next legislative session and was wondering how to kind of keep in touch to pace um, to pace themselves with your updates. You know, we talked about how this is fast moving. And then someone in Maine is also sort of looking, how can we at the state level make this better? And how can we perhaps um, work in an environment where an, we have an election outcome that is um, not positive in terms of um, who is in our um, legislature or our governorship? Well, you know, the league is a great nationwide network. The ACLU is another one. Um, I, you, I, I was, I emailed some people already who put their email addresses in the chat, but one thing that I think, you know, I can commit to doing is as soon as we have the legislation that we plan to introduce in Massachusetts ready, we, I can share that out with the league uh, folks who I assume can, you know, distribute that throughout your network uh, to make sure that anybody who's interested can get that legislation filed in the state where you live. Um, the ACLU, likewise, you know, has a nationwide network, and we'll make sure that all the all the ACLU folks uh, in every state have access to the legislation that we're filing here in Massachusetts. Haley has re re referenced some uh, legislation that California has passed on this issue. You know, I assume you know she can share that out with everybody here as well. So, you know, just sharing model legislation, I think, is a great great first step. And then, you know, we at the ACLU of Massachusetts will be developing campaign materials to go along with this location data campaign. So fact sheets and, you know, talking points and things like that. And we can, we can make sure everybody has access to that as well. Yeah, just to add that, um, I know it, particularly in Oregon, um, you have a, you have a good attorney general's office. They're currently, um, we're involved in a dialogue right now around uh, consumer privacy legislation. I know that they are thinking about reproductive justice and reproductive rights, mm -hmm. as well as gender affirming care. So um, there will be some action there, strong ACLU in Oregon. Um, and then of course, you also have a strong ACLU in Maine that um, is very well versed in these issues. So, um, you know, I'll plug the, the ACLU for, uh, for, uh, for Cade. Um, and I'll also, just in my continuing my um, link sharing, uh, we have our own um, kind of loose knit group of uh, grassroots groups that EFF keeps in touch with at the state on, and municipal level called the Electronic Frontier Alliance. So particularly if you're already in a group and you might be interested in um, getting more information from us or joining the Alliance, um, Please, by all means, um, we're we're always looking for more boots on the ground. Um, you know, we are a small state level legislation team. It's pretty much me, um, <laughs> but um, we're always looking for for more people to work with um, and for people who who care about our issues. So. Thank you. Yeah, John, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I mean, I had a had a quick question. Um, I think Kate early on said that um, one of the recommendations completely understandable is to delete your own browsing history. Um, but that's not to say, of course, that the browser doesn't actually save your browsing history and associate it with your IP address. Isn't that, isn't that correct? Well, Google certainly is retaining that information. So, you know, your browser is one thing. The police getting a warrant to come to your house and seize your computer. Yeah. Um, you know, they would be able to apply forensics that could probably, you know, uncover your browsing history, even if you've like removed it, you know, deleting your browsing history is mostly useful for preventing someone in your own house from accessing information uh, about what internet, you know, how you've used the internet at home. It is not going to stop the police from accessing that information if they serve a legal demand on a company like Google. Yeah, I always thought it almost gave a false sense of security in some ways because the information is available to everybody except you. <laughs> um, right, but you know, for some people, and this, there are some people who have done great um, breakdowns on what's called like a threat model. So that's an important thing for people to consider. Who are you worried about? Are you worried about your boyfriend or your husband or your father accessing information about, you know, what websites you've been visiting? Well, in that case, you know, deleting your browser history might be really important uh, because they might have access to your computer or your phone and be looking to see, you know, what websites you're visiting. But that's not really that helpful if your threat model is that you're worried about, you know, the attorney general of the state of Texas, um, because he has various other methods uh, that he can use to access your information. 
And here's a second question, which is um, kind of a little bit of a ta tangent, but um, does Zoom record webinars like this and retain them and create transcripts that are searchable? I've, I've heard that it does. I've heard that you can That's get a, a great question. I don't know the answer I don't to know off the top hand. of my head. Yeah. It is a great question. Becky, I see a hand. Do you know? Yeah, I, I am an admin. I opened up our Zoom account when COVID first hit. And um, I don't know how much it has improved. And I can get back to you on that because we have a member who was a plank owner who was given um, like federal federally sponsored access when Zoom first started. But uh, their, their bandwidth for retaining videotapes and video recordings does not fit their economic model. They want to bounce you off unless you spend a lot more. So they just go away. So when we are recording um, candidate debates and stuff on Zoom, we transfer them over to a YouTube channel or something as quickly as we can. I wouldn't trust it for privacy purposes, but from an economic model, I don't think it's a big source of threat. Interesting. I, I have a similar question about Alexa and Echo and all those sort of devices in a home that are um, sort of speaker enabled. I don't know if either of you have an answer to that one either. I mean, I, you know, my understanding is that you can configure your Alexa device so that it does it like deletes your search history or whatever, how much I would trust Amazon on that front, you know, I wouldn't. Um, I know that it, companies that use um, language processing models like Alexa, like Echo, like the Google Home product, um, they do sometimes make those recordings available to people inside those companies. And that's mostly to train their artificial intelligence models to make, to improve the models. You know, I, but that doesn't mean that there aren't human beings who can listen to those recordings. And it also doesn't mean that law enforcement can not access them under certain circumstances. There has been at least one case in which uh, someone's, uh, a prosecutor's obtained information from someone's Alexa device. Um, I think it was a murder case actually. Yep, um, I think it's I Florida. <laughs> yeah, okay, in Florida, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't trust those things at all, personally. Definitely would not invite one of those devices into my home, would not recommend using them. Um, but if people do use them, you know, don't recommend saying, hey, Alexa, how can I get abortion pills? You know, not a great idea, <laughs> I would say. Fair enough. Um, so we're running, sort of running low on time. Um, I'll say the question about the EU legislation being a, a model. Um, if either of you have links that you want to throw into the chat, maybe that's how we can answer that one. Um, and maybe that also, uh, that is a whole topic in itself that we maybe we could return to at some future point. Um, but I do want to get to sort of the questions and comments that I've seen coming up in the chat about sort of the chilling effect, which you talked a little bit about. Um, there's sort of questions here about um, whether prosecutors would go after healthcare providers and the effect that that might have on, on the willingness of providers to offer the care. And then also there's a question that just came in about the chilling effect it might have on people who are pregnant um, and the pregnancy care that they might seek, um, especially you know if there's a miscarriage or something else that might put them at risk of criminalization. I mean, yeah, it's a huge threat. I don't know, Haley, if you want to say anything more than that. The, the answer is yes, there is a chilling effect. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I haven't seen hard numbers, but certainly from, you know, we are not a, a reproductive justice group, right? We're a data, we're a data privacy group. So when we've worked with people in that community, I think anecdotally, I'm certainly hearing a lot of, of concern, um, but I haven't seen hard numbers on that particularly. And so to the telehealth question, you know, that's a big, that's a big unknown. You know, I know that there are people in what I, you know, what we can call free states, places like California, New York, you know, Massachusetts that, that have robust um, abortion rights guaranteed by law. There are a lot of people who are trying to think through, you know, what should, what kinds of risks, you know, should these providers take on in terms of providing telehealth uh, to people in states where abortion is banned? Again, I think that you know ultimately that's going to have to be an individual choice that practitioners make for themselves. 
um, because the law is unsettled. And frankly, with this Supreme Court, I don't think that we can guarantee by any stretch of the imagination that, you know, that higher courts are going to protect um, either the licenses of doctors in states like Massachusetts that may want to provide telehealth care to people in places where abortion is banned or, you know, prevent, pre prevent them from being, you know, extradited or prosecuted. So these are all kind of unknowns, but, you know, I don't, I don't trust the uh, Clarence Thomas court with issues like this one, for sure. Yeah, and I, I would also add, you know, you do get some protections from, um, from the federal health privacy law, from state privacy laws, but a lot of things that people think of as health are not actually covered by that law. So, um, you know, if it comes from a healthcare provider, you have some protections. Of course, that doesn't necessarily protect you against warrants and that sort of thing. Um, but also, you know, there are things like, you know, online mental health um, counseling, those really fall in a gray area of how those protections um, are set up. And so, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that's unsettled about telehealth. Mm. Yeah, I think we're, we're up on time, um, but I think there's a lot of lingering questions so we just sort of have to wait and see how some of this sort of prosecution legislation, et cetera, plays out. Um, but thank you for, both of you for coming tonight and for offering some insight into what we might see and what we are already seeing. I think it's really important to know the state of play for all of this. Um, and thanks everyone for listening. Um, and we did record this, so we'll make that recording available for folks. Um, and yeah, have a good night, everybody. Thanks folks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. That was great.